So uh, good afternoon. Um, hopefully people are doing well. Uh, kind of at the win end of week 11 for the course. So it seems like we've come a long way. Um, only have a few more weeks to go. Um, so week 12, I think I've made available. I'll go back and check on Blackboard. Um, I think the material is there. Um, if not, I'll make, I'll make it visible so people can get to work on that over the weekend if they want to. Um, a couple of, you know, a few procedural announcements will sort of continue with the same pattern um, that we've kind of held throughout most of the semester. Remember that the written assignment concerning chapter 18 is due tomorrow afternoon at about five. But that written assignment, like with the other more recent written assignments, it's more of an issue of, of just sort of reading through the summary and thinking about thinking through whether or not you have any questions after you wind up taking some notes on, on, the, uh, on the reading the reading from chapter 18 and the reading assignment itself. So uh, the reading assignment, I think, is basically a summary. So you kind of want to keep this close. It's a shorter summary than what's in the book. There are a couple of examples, I think, on the reading assignment, which might be helpful to look at the study a little bit. Um, I think next week, um, if I remember right, we should have, ah, right. So on Monday, there's, I think it's homework 10 um, on my stat lab, which is due um, homework 10. Um, concerns chapter 18. Um, there are a number of number of problems to work on there. So if you get a chance to work on that, maybe today or tomorrow, that would be great. Um, if you've already done the reading and thought a little bit about, about the material, there is a written assignment seven, which is due next Tuesday as well um, at 5 p.m. So that's sort of the standard pattern over the, over the course. Um, if you have any questions about written assignment seven, don't hesitate to send me an email about them. Um, I gave written assignment seven in the fall of 2020, and when grading it, I found that, you know, there were a number of things that students were trying to do, which made sense to them, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily, you know, the, the, what the, what the, it wasn't quite what the, what the questions were asking for. So if you read through written assignment seven, if you look at the rubric for written assignment seven, but have difficulty making sense of the questions, don't hesitate to ask. It's fine to ask me. Um, you can go to the TA office hours for the course, yes, ask the TA, um, or, or really anybody else, um, you know, would be okay. Um, the, and I guess that's sort of where we're at, you know, that's sort of the last assignment that we were, we're going to work on from this week that's due next week. Um, there'll be some additional homework next week, additional things to do. Next week, we're going to cover chapters 19 and 20. Um, we'll start to talk a little about chapter 19 today, because I feel like you know, over the, over the last day of last week and the first couple of days this week, I think we probably talked through chapter 18 enough. I'd like to summarize, let's, let's summarize maybe a little bit in the first few minutes today, talking a little about what was achieved over the last few chapters um, and talk a little, a little bit more about a couple of things that you might be curious about. Um, and, and then I mean, what you're curious about is probably in chapter 19, or at least some of the things you might be curious about. Um, so we'll do part of that today, part of that next week. Um, what you're going to find, I think, going forward in both chapters 20 and 21 is that the sort of content of those chapters, if, you, if you've internalized the idea about, about how the statistics we're talking about are related to various sampling distributions, I don't think you're going to be too surprised by what happens over the, over the, concluding, the concluding chapters of, the, of the, the book that we will cover. Um, I anticipate that there'll be an eighth reading assignment next week. Um, and I think that's enough. Um, there's no, no reason, I think, to have another one. Um, so there'll be a reading assignment in week 12 that's due in week 13. Um, there'll be no reading assignment, uh, not reading, it's written assignment. There'll be no written assignment assigned in week 13 that will be due in week 14. I'd like to treat week 14 um, as sort of a time where we can kind of catch up on things. People can ask questions. I intend to cover some new material, but um, as far as I'm concerned, the material that I'm going to talk about in week 14 shouldn't really be present on the final. It's just some extra stuff that we have time to kind of talk about. And I've yet to really make a decision about what that ought to be. Um, so it might be related to the current conversation about, um, about, about hypothesis testing, um, or it might be related to some things we talked about earlier in the course when we talked about regression, or it might involve something called the chi-squared statistic also, we talked a little about that, very briefly about that at the beginning of the course. So those types of things, we might talk about that last week, but you know, you shouldn't really expect them on the final in week 14. 
We can also use part of week 14 to review um, if people have, have questions that they want to talk about, have concerns, um, or are worried about any particular thing. But I kind of want that last week to be, a, to be a week where you can begin to orient yourself in the course, to, to take stock of where we're at, um, what we've covered, um, to begin the process of review. Um, because the final exam for the course, you know, like with the other two exams, it'll take place over a few days, but you won't have a week to do it because of when the final exam for this course falls. So if I remember right, the final exam period, I think what I'll do is I'll probably open it up on Monday, the 26th, you'll have three days to do it. Um, you'll be able to complete it right, right up into the point um, where, you know, the, if we were having an in-person final, so to speak, um, when that in-person in, in final would take place. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, like, I've, like I've told many people, I think, I think the class, I think overall people's effort has been quite good. So um, you should keep doing what you've been doing throughout the semester, um, only a little bit to go. Um, and a lot of what's gonna happen over the last couple of weeks is gonna be familiar anyway. You shouldn't you know, be on autopilot or anything like that, but with, with what we're doing, um, hopefully the conversation over chapters 20 and 21 will be at least somewhat familiar on the basis of what we've already discussed. Um, so with all that said, do people have any questions, any concerns? Okay, um, so if the answer is no, um, I guess what I'll do today is I'll spend some time, you know, recapping kind of where we're at in some general sense. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little about a couple of issues that will come up in chapter 19 that I think are interesting. Um, chapter 19 will be part of the reading for next week, but if you wanna get ahead and, and read chapter 19 on your own over the weekend, feel free to do so. Um, so I'll go ahead and share the screen. I'll write down a few things. Um, I just again wanna provide a kind of a summary description of where we're at. So remember, you know, the content of chapters 16, 17, and 18 is inference. So that's um, the, the part of the course we're in. It's called statistical inference. Um, and that inference can generally can take two forms. Um, estimation, which was the content of chapters 16 and 17. Um, and, you know, the null hypothesis significance testing framework, um, which was the material we discussed in chapter 18. Um, you can ask, um, is there a relation? Is there a relation between these chapters? The answer, maybe not surprisingly, is yes. Um, the content of inference is somehow dictated um, by sampling distributions of statistics. And so to summarize kind of where we're, where we're at with, with that, um, you know, if, if, you've, if you've sort of followed the conversation or if the conversation is making sense to you at this point, yeah. if the words make sense and you have a sense of what I'm about to say, um, I would say that you're in pretty good shape um, for, for the course. So, you know, what we've talked about, what we've talked about so far is, is basically something like this under some somewhat mild conditions, I guess, um, maybe not. Um, things like estimators like p hat or x bar. So, you, you know, at this point, you should probably be comfortable with what these notations mean. Um, have associated probability distributions. Um, those are the sampling distributions of the statistics and it's known, it's known that they both are very similar. Um, and so if you're dealing with something like p hat, if you're trying to infer information about population proportion, 
then we know that p hat is, is approximately normally distributed with these characteristics. Um, so we're talking about a sample size of n. You know, n is, is, is usually for us gonna be some kind of number like 100 or you know, other numbers that we've talked about so far. Um, we also know that for the sample mean, we get a picture that looks something like this. And so again, under some mild conditions, the sample mean is approximately normally distributed with these characteristics. Again, the rule of n is the sample size. Um, you know, again, with the notation, I'm hoping you're comfortable with it, but when you write something down like mu, you're talking about the population mean, not the sample mean. When you write down something like sigma, that symbol that's right there, that's the population standard deviation. And so basically with these two things we're talking about right here, um, the fact that the sampling distribution of both p hat and x bar look the way they do is the content for us of the central limit theorem. So when you're checking these conditions, you're basically just trying to, to, to think about whether or not it's plausible to apply something like the central limit theorem. Um, you know, and, and then if you, you can convince yourself that that's somewhat reasonable, then you can try to use the tools of inference that we have at our disposal, um, which basically are, are, are associated somehow to knowing this information about the sampling distribution. Um, and so that's the content so far of what we of what we talked about. I think this is sort of where basically chapter 17 ends. Um, in chapter 18, when we talk about the null hypothesis framework, um, we pass to, to the study of test statistics. And um, test statistics are sort of like a standardized version of p hat or a standardized version of x bar. And so again, after chapter 18, when you're, when you're thinking about null hypothesis significance testing, the test statistic will come in one of two forms. Um, it will either look something like this. So it's a quotient. It's either p hat minus some assumed value for p divided by um, the actual standard deviation of p hat. And, you know, again, using notation, which I'm hoping is kind of familiar to people, this thing is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation one. Um, again, you know, the, the reason why it might be reasonable to think about this as being normally distributed is the central limit theorem basically guarantees that p hat is under these conditions. And all this formula is, all this quotient is, is a translation of p hat. You're basically moving, the act of subtracting p moves the distribution over zero. And the act of dividing by the standard deviation of p hat basically either shortens or makes the distribution wider um, to sort of manipulate um, the standard deviation of p hat into one. So it's a transformation of p hat. Um, so you're in either this condition, uh, either you're looking at this test statistic or you're looking at a test statistic which looks like this. Now, if you're, if you're in 18, there's usually some sort of underlying assumption you're making about either p or mu. Um, the, the second guy is a little trickier and I'll point out why that is. At least I'll try to point out why that is. Um, so I'll write this TN minus one right here. Why is this not normally distributed, but this guy is? There's, there's a difference between these two quotients. The, the primary difference between these quotients and the thing to think about when you're trying to think about why you would not expect this guy to be normal, but maybe this guy is, is that when you're dealing with this quotient right here, because you're in chapter 18, because you're thinking about the significance testing, P and N are actual numbers, the things you plug in. And so they're numbers which don't vary with the random sample. So in this quotient, p hat is the only thing that varies with the random sample and nothing else. But if you're dealing, uh, but if you're in a situation where you're trying to do inference about the about a population mean, using x bar as an estimator for that, and you're thinking about this kind of standardized or test statistic, which looks like this this guy down here, notice there are two things that vary with the random sample, x bar and s. Um, so you have the numerator of the fraction varying with the random sample, and x bar is normally distributed in this case. And you have S varying with the random sample as well. S, is, S also has a probability distribution. Um, it's not quite chi-squared distribution, but it's, it's pretty close. So basically, it turns out that when you look at the quotient of this random variable with this random variable, you get something that, that can be explained with the T distribution. Um, so that particular, the particular content of the statement, people verified this about 100 years ago. 
Um, when the author is giving you a description in chapter 18 of the person who worked at the Guinness Brewery um, when they were trying to estimate, you know, what, when they were trying to think about what was going on when they were brewing beer 100 years ago, that's kind of where it first came up. Um, the author of the paper, um, the author of the work that in, in which the tea distribution first became um, pretty well known, had to write pseudonym, I guess the word is anonymously. Um, and, and that was because he was employed by the brewery and he was trying to publish this on, on the side um, as part of his work. And so he went under the name student. And so sometimes you also see tea distribution called students tea distribution, or you see other things like studentized residuals. It's an artifact of, of, the, of the pseudonym that the author used in the paper, um, which, was, which was the first time I think people had seriously considered things like the tea distribution. So it's an interesting part of the book, um, you know, so it's worth, you know, if you're curious about it, you can always, you can always find a lot of information like that. The stories that are associated with, with a lot of the people that are involved are sometimes pretty interesting as well. And so that's kind of where we're at. Um, we know a little bit about the, the test statistics, the standardized statistics, we at least know their distributions. And when we try to infer something about, um, you know, the population characteristics, we're sort of keeping this in the background. Um, and so the framework, um, at least in chapter 18, is that, you know, when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about how, how to go through a problem or think about a problem, you know, the first major step is to check the conditions. And so those are described in the text. And we've talked a little about them as well. Um, and then maybe the second step would be to formulate you know, formulate the statistical hypothesis that you're trying to study. So we'll see a few more examples of this today. We talked about a few examples, I think, yesterday and on Monday. Um, but the, the hypothesis that you're talking about, you're typically thinking about a null hypothesis, which is the uninteresting hypothesis. So for example, um, you could assert or you could think about a null hypothesis that, you know, the population proportion is some fixed number and the alternative, if you're dealing with a two-sided test, say, is that it isn't. I think yesterday we primarily were dealing with one-sided hypothesis testing, but it could be two-sided as well. Um, as a result of, of one and two, mm -hmm. um, the sampling distribution of P hat has a certain shape a certain appearance um, but we usually consider this for the work that we're going to do we're doing in, in 18 we usually consider the test statistic in its distribution and you know it's also not unusual to think about the question, what is the significance level at which the test is going to be performed? You know, typical, typical alpha would be maybe 0.05 or 0.01 or something like that. And so when you're when you're at the point where when you're when you're here, um, you know usually there's an experiment. So there's some experimental result which causes. Well, I guess I should say produces a realization of the test statistic. It's a number. And you gauge um, the compatibility, compatibility of the of the data that, that, that we're talking about here, the experimental result with the model on that basis. And so, you know, the, the basically the test statistic is, is, is sort of what's, what allows you to say something about whether or not you think that the data is in some way compatible with the model. So we talked, I think yesterday, either about 
I think mostly we talked yesterday about things like p-value. So in some sense, the p-value represents that, that compatibility in a pretty concrete way. And so when you're thinking about a low p-value, you tend to associate low p-values with incompatibility. Um, so we did a couple of examples yesterday, one of which you had a p-value that was quite low, which would cause us to reject the null hypothesis and believe that we had statistically significant evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Um, there was another example, and I think it was the second example in which we came up with, with the p-value, which was not terribly low. It was, I think, if I remember right, on the order of about 14%, 0.14 or so. In that, in that situation, um, I think we would make a judgment that the data was, was not terribly incompatible with, with the model. And so in the second example that we did, we got a p-value and the p-value was larger than the significance level. And this would cause us to fail to reject the null hypothesis at, a, at that level of significance, which I think was 0.05 in that example. Um, so you might wanna go back and review the examples. Um, I have them as well on, on, on the computer, but it's, it's sort of worthwhile. You know, we, we saw these two different examples. Um, they were both one-sided tests. Um, but it was the value of the, of the test statistic which was sort of telling us this and we could compute a p-value as a result. Um, from a practical point of view, you know, it's important to understand, I think, you know, what a, what a test statistic is just to, to properly, to, to try to properly sort of conceptualize what's going on in the course. But as an aside, you should be aware, I think that StatCrunch can do these significance tests pretty much automatically if you know where to look. And so we, I think we talked a little about that yesterday. So is everyone with me so far in the discussion? So this was where things stand. Any, is it all right? So again, I can't emphasize enough. I can't emphasize enough um, the importance of understanding the sampling distribution of the statistic. Um, that's sort of the technical tool, which is kind of, which is kind of, um, it's, it's just sort of the technical tool that makes inference go, so to speak, at least in this classical environment. Um, there are other types of inference you can, you, can, you can do, but those tend to occur, you know, the other type of inference, the other major school when you're thinking about statistical inference tends to be Bayesian inference and they use a different tool. So sampling distributions don't play quite the same role there as they do in the classical environment, which is what we're discussing. So, um, you know, and of course you always kind of have to kind of convince yourself that the sampling distribution has this normal shape. So when you're thinking about a problem, when you see it um, and you, you know, you see these summaries, the textbook problems, you know, it's expected that, that, that things are done right. But in real life, if you find yourself reading a paper and you can't convince yourself of, you know, on the basis of sort of reading it and thinking it through, that some of these conditions are, are satisfied, you should realize that you're dealing with maybe a point of departure from from the platonic ideal of inference. And you, it's natural to wonder, you know, what the consequences are of, of, of that point of departure. You know, do the tools apply in quite the same way? You know, we saw a couple of examples. Um, you saw one example, I think it was on written assignment six. Um, and we looked at maybe in class a more extreme version of that same problem where things like the success failure condition fail to hold. So in that case, if the, if the success failure condition fails to hold, it's possible that the sampling distribution is non-normal. And as a result, um, the inference won't, won't mean as much. Um, the tool breaks down and the more the success failure condition fails to hold, um, in some way it's a measure of the extent to which the tools break down. So um, if you find yourself in a position where you think that like if you're estimating some, some value for a proportion, if, uh, if you suspect that, that the proportion is very close to zero or very close to one, but the sample size is not terribly large, you, you might have a problem there. And you know you might construct a confidence interval, but it may have no meaning at all. Um, so you know you, we saw an example of that, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, a weird pathology. So it's it's interesting you can use stack crunch to sort of simulate and kind of see where things break down. It's a nice tool for that. Um, now on the homework on the exam, um, you can probably expect some questions in which you know people are asking you where, where, where I guess I am asking you, um, you know, about whether or not the conditions are plausibly satisfied. So you know you kind of have to have them in the back of your head. Um, I think there was a question on exam two as well when you know you had some histogram which represented the simulation of the sampling distribution, and you know the simulation of the sampling distribution. If I remember the problem correctly. Um, it was right skewed, so you would have some doubt that 
um, the inferential techniques that we have developed so far applied. It's always reasonable to sort of look into the matter, um, to think it through. Um, you, you know, you don't always have to accept the conclusions of some paper. Um, if you feel like you feel like there's a problem of some kind in gathering data, um, if you feel like there's a problem of some kind with the estimates that are being made. Um, so, you know, it's important to read, use your common sense when you're thinking about things. Um, so with, with all that in mind, a um, couple of more things to discuss. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm probably gonna pick and choose a bit in chapter 19 and then, um, you know, allow you to do the reading and, and think it through. Um, maybe do the homework next week. Um, but the stuff, that, the stuff that I'd rather talk about in chapter 19, I'd, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about type one and type two error. Um, type one and type two error are, I mean, error is, is, is almost, a, almost a pejorative term. It, um, maybe, maybe a better way to think about it is, is that, you know, when you're thinking about what, what people usually call type one and type two error, they're kind of a consequence of the modeling scheme we're using, a uh, consequence of the decision framework that we're operating within. And when we think about what type one and type two error are, the, the typical presentation is people draw like a little, little table, like a matrix, possibilities. And it looks something like this. Um, you know, here, I think along the, the top row, um, you know, people generally record the two possibilities for the null hypothesis. Um, and I'll talk, I'll talk a little about that in a second. Um, to explain why you should be suspicious of this framework, but you know it's what we have. Um, yes, Lily. Sorry, what do those say? It says null something and then null something. Okay, let me. Wait. True. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Right, and so um, right. You know, I always I always figure there's a reason that I type most things now. So. Um, you know, when you're dealing with a null hypothesis, I guess, you know, it's, it's some, it's a belief, right? It's a statement. So two things could be, could be correct about it. Either, either it's true or it's false. And when you're, when you're confronted with the results of some statistical test, you can either reject the null or you can fail to reject the null. So um, remembering the notation H, H naught, you know, could represent a variety of different possible statistical hypotheses. Um, if you go on and take some additional courses, sometimes, you know, these are not even, these are not even formulated, you know, in a precisely mathematical kind of way, or the formulation is too complicated. So you don't want to write down a bunch of inequalities. So sometimes you just write them down. Um, but again, this, when you're dealing with this sort of table, um, there are two. There are two types of. There are two types of quote unquote problems. Um, when the null hypothesis is true, but the result of the test causes you to reject it, um, this is known as a type one error. Um, when the null hypothesis is false, but you fail to reject it, this is known as a type two error. And the truth of the matter is, in the other two locations, you know. You're happy because you know the test kind of kind of does what you want it to do. Um, in most classes, like like this one, um, and I guess historically this was probably not the case, but um, we, at first at least, are concerned, and we can formulate about uh, something, some statements about type one error. And the reason, the reason why, you know, when you're beginning to think about, about the framework is the type one error is pretty easy, easy to discuss. And, and that's because, and, and I'll, so I'll write this down, but you have to think, think a second about why it's true. Um, the probability of making a type one error is equal to the significance level of the test, the significance level you choose. Now, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if that fact is obvious or not. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little about it. 
um, trying trying to give you a rough description about why at least that statement is believable, but that's an important state, statement to remember. I think you think that the significance level is this thing, and, and we've described it in terms of we've talked about the significance level in terms of its 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 uh, its function um, at you know to cordon off these sort of regions where um, where we feel like the data is incompatible with the model. But you know when you phrase it this way, like it's the probability of making a type one error. The feelings people have about the significance level often change, and you know it's, it seems like you're. Um, I mean, it seems like a strange thing to, to to decide even when you see it in these terms. But why would why would something like this be reasonable? So when you're thinking, when we are when we're conducting a significance test. Um, and we're thinking about the significance level when we're thinking about a p-value or something like that that's associated to the test, we are asking about where the extreme values are if H naught is true. <laughs> And so um, if you assume that the null hypothesis is true, that, that's sort of essential to setting up the test. Um, if the null is true, you know, like if you're dealing with a like a, a test involving a proportion, um, let's just say for the sake of simplicity that the conditions are met. Like if, if the null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.4 and the alternative is that P is not equal to 0.4 and my alpha level is just again, for the sake of for the sake of the exposition, suppose it's just 0.05. Um, in that situation, the consequence of, of the belief that p is equal to 0.4 is that the sampling distribution of p hat has this basic appearance. It's normal. It's this nice normal curve, and the center is over 0.04, and the range of area in the tails is combined. So let's say. It, um, I guess I should draw some arrows here, so I'll try to explain what they mean. That area, that area that's shaded right here is 0 0.025. That area right there is 0 0.025. So the tail areas are the regions which are thought to be extreme under the null hypothesis. So if the null is true, this is the picture that we get. Um, so we only reject H sub naught if P hat falls in the shaded regions. But the probability, um, I guess I'll probably write this down in words, of P hat falling in shaded regions in that picture. All, all that is, is, is the probability of, of either being here or here, but that's 0.05, right? So the, the, you know, if the null is true, um, we're sort of saying that P hat falls, if the null is true, the significance level is actually um, equal to the probability that P hat will fall into one of those shaded regions. It's equal to the probability of making a type one error by definition. Um, though it's a little weird, it's a little weird to think about things in that way. Now it turns out that there are consequences of that. Um, you know, so if the uh, if if you're dealing with if you're if you're in a situation where um, um, so let's I mean again I can take an example. I hope this example is non-controversial. If if it, if it isn't, then um, maybe let me know later. But when people are thinking about things like extrasensory perception, most people are going to take the position that the null hypothesis ought to be something like extrasensory perception is not a real phenomenon. Um, you know, it's it's not a universally accepted proposition, so I'm not I'm not telling you what to believe about it. But what most people are going to think is that, right? They think that that's a reasonable null. Um, and the alternative hypothesis is that um, extrasensory perception is real. So when you do is, is a real phenomenon, and so when you design an experiment, you know, you wind up getting the sampling distribution of some quantity you're trying to measure. So where does where does the where does the where, the, where does the where does the experimental evidence lie? I guess so. Most people are going to accept the belief that ESP isn't real, and bec but because of this fact, if your significance level is consistently five percent across all possible types of tests you could run on ESP, 
um, you're still going to wind up with unusual results 5% of the time. And so 5% of the time, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your significance level is 0.05, you, you get an unusual result, even though ESP is not real. And so you're going to find up, you're, you're going to find out, or you're going to find, you're going to want to reject the null hypothesis exactly in those situations. Should you? Um, I don't know, right? I mean, so, but that's the framework. Um, if you think about the consequences of that or what that might mean, you know, if you have a hundred different studies where they're all studying ESP in more or less the same way, and they all use a significance level of 0.05, um, you're sort of expecting out of those 100 studies, five of those studies to reveal that ESP is, is a phenomenon that, it, 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 that is real. And you're expecting maybe about 95 of them not to, not to reflect that under the, belief that the, under the belief that ESP is in fact not real, which is probably plausible. Um, so what happens if those five papers are the ones that get published in, in journals and the other 95 people ignore um, well, I mean, you know, if you're just looking at the scientific literature and you only look at what's published, then you might think ESP is real because that's all you're reading. So do people, do people see what I'm saying with this? That's a consequence of this type of testing mechanism, and it's a worrisome consequence. Um, so that's like what you're talking about there is, is almost, it's almost called publication bias, where, you know, the statistically significant results are the only ones that ever make an appearance in the literature, and you don't see anything else. Um, so that's a concern. Um, so the type one error, you know, it's, it's something that you should be aware of. You should be aware of its definition and maybe more importantly, what are the consequences of type one error for the scientific literature, you know, beyond, even if you do everything right, um, you're still going to get type one error a bunch of the time. Um, and so, you know, and you don't, you don't have access to the studies that prove the null or, or, don't, or don't conflict with the null, I guess I should say. Um, there's also this concept of type two error. And people tend not to talk about this quite as much. Um, and so type two error, so going back to the matrix possibilities. Oops, I think I went too far. Where did I put that? Right here, I think. Um, if you think about the type two error, wait, it's not on this page at all. Where did I put that? No, it's somewhere. Ah, there it is. So the type two error um, is, 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 is another error that this type of testing regime can actually make. Um, it could be that the null hypothesis is false and you failed to reject it. Um, that's making a type two error. Um, the, the measurement that's associated to a type two error is called, the is, is called the power of the test. So when discussing type two error, in the matrix that we have, um, one discusses the power. Of the test. Um, now, I'll talk about this very briefly. I'll try to draw a picture, but I'd, I'd like to leave it to 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 I mean, before I get into to too much detail, there, I'd like people to read, you know, the last section of chapter 19. Which, which addresses some of this. And it's related to this question about like, well, okay, 0.05 or 0.01, why would one choose a significance level at all? And it's related to this question of power and the author will describe a little bit historically about why those numbers might've been chosen and maybe why in the modern day, it's not such a good idea to choose them in that way. Um, so statistical power is a measurement. So the power of the statistical test represents the probability of rejecting a false null. Um, and so typically one has um, simple beta. If beta represents the probability of failure to reject false null, then the power is equal to one minus beta. And so um, it turns out, and, and it may not be clear from the picture I'm about to draw, but it's sort of the standard image when one's considering the trade-offs between alpha and beta. Um, they, they, they work against each other sometimes. Um, so strong values for alpha 
are sometimes related to tests which are underpowered. And so you are usually worried about one or the other type of error. Um, do you wanna make a type one or a type two error and trying to judge what significance level you choose, like the significance levels you choose it sort of informs the probability of making one and the other type of error. Um, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, I'd like people to try to read chapter 19, um, but the picture that people normally draw looks a bit like this. I mean, if you accept the idea, it's all it's it's easier to draw for a one-tailed test, I guess. So, and again, for proportions, they typically draw two curves, which are of course meant to be identical. So here's one up here. So here's the other same curve, but translated. Um, you know, if we're thinking about proportions, we can think about H naught being true. We can also think about this picture being associated to H naught false. Re re redraw that. Um, so if the null hypothesis is true, and let's just take our example when we're dealing with point four, um, we're thinking that the true proportion is centered over point four. And, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, the P being greater than 0.4, we're thinking about that region as being associated to the probability of making a type one error. Um, but if H naught is false, then maybe, you know, the actual value of the proportion is somewhat to the right of 0.4. And that number over here um, is, is associated to, um, in the region that you can't see over here, is, is associated with, with a, if H naught is false, um, is associated with the failure to reject the null because numbers over here correspond to this region over here in this diagram. With the null hypothesis significance testing framework, you're, you're always trying to figure out what the distribution looks like if the null hypothesis is true, not if it's false. And so basically, if you get an anywhere, in the, if you get a number over here, you fail to reject the null because it's kind of in this region, but maybe you should. And so, because it's in the tail, because if H naught is false, then P prime, if it represents the actual value of the true proportion, I guess it's probably easier if I put a number on it, make it be about 0 .0, 0 0.6. Like suppose that the value of the proportion is actually 0 0.6, but you're thinking about it being 0 0.4. Um, you know, if you get a number in this region under the conditions of the test, you fail to reject, but getting a number here is equivalent to getting a number in this tail when you look at the actual value of, of the proportion. So maybe you should reject the H naught. And so in this case, um, bigger values here, you know, are in some way associated with, with different probability, you know, with different probabilities of failing to reject the null. And so there's sort of a, there's sort of a diagram people draw. I encourage you to look at it in, in chapter 19. Um, but when you're thinking about this type of thing, there's a trade-off between alpha and beta. It's an interesting discussion in the book, so I advise you to read it. We can talk about it more next week, maybe after you have had a chance to do so. Um, that's the main thing in chapter 19 that I'd like to highlight. A lot of the other stuff in chapter 19 is probably not that surprising. Um, there's a brief discussion of how, um, of how the framework for significance testing is related to confidence interval construction. Um, these are these are these are some of the things that I'd probably like to talk about, but but very to touch on very lightly next week, um, you know. But I'll give you a chance to maybe read it first before I go into detail. Um, so, do people have any questions so far about what we're talking about? Um, again, chapter 19 sort of wraps up, kind of glues together what we talked about in 16, 17, 18. It's worth a read. Talks about some new material related to power. Doesn't really get into power calculations that carefully. There's a formula, um, author does not present it, it's probably for the best. StatCrunch can calculate statistical power. So there's a way of doing it on StatCrunch if you're curious about it. Um, but power, I tend not to ask about on exams, but it is type, that type two error, you know, and the probability of making a type two error, it's something that should be in the back of your mind. Questions so far? Anything at all? So I'd like to kind of move into chapter 20. Again, um, I'll give you a chance to read 19. I think it's more high concept. It's worth a read first before I talk about it again. Um, chapter 20 will be familiar. Um, I'd only like to talk about a piece of it today. 
and then maybe give people a chance to work on some problems. Because um, again, we've talked quite a bit over the last few days. So you can think about this set of notes as being kind of an introduction to chapter 20. Um, in chapter 20, we're interested in measuring um, this version of group differences. Um, so using the type of tools that we have so far, we want, you know, maybe more precisely, we, we want to say, we want to say something about either the difference of population proportions or the difference of population means. So in this formulation, P1 and P2 are proportions for, I guess what I'm gonna call independent in, in the independent populations. Here, let me make this look a little better. Um, something similar for mu one minus mu two, um, mu sub one and mu sub two are means for independent populations. So when you talk about independence in this context, um, very roughly, um, independence in this context means that you can't know that your populations are separated in some sense. Um, knowing information about one population doesn't really tell you anything about the other population. That's generally how you might internalize the idea of independence. Um, where does this come up? Um, if you're dealing with, with, with differences in proportions, um, a natural application is in, um, in trying to estimate who's going to win an election. And the reason is that if you have a two candidate election and everyone votes, um, then what you're, then, 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 the, then the winner of the election is decided by um, whether or not the difference in the proportion of voters which support candidate one minus the proportion of voters who support candidate two is positive or negative. And so when people report on public opinion polls, when they're thinking about candidates, even, even three or four or five candidates, they're doing a version of what we're going to do in this class next week. Um, when you're dealing with differences of means, um, you know, there are many applications there. You can talk about the difference in mean incomes between different groups within, a, within different subsets of a particular population. You can study whether or not there's a statistically significant difference according to your estimates. Um, but with a lot of what we're going to do, the tools that we're going to use are more or less the same, and they depend on knowing something about the sampling distribution of, of the estimators. So what kind of estimators are we going to use? Um, they're, they're the ones that you would guess that we would use. Um, so for, for estimates which involve, um, so I guess I would say, maybe I'll, just, I'll include that word, but for For, for the difference in proportions, we estimate with the difference of sample proportions. For the difference of means, we estimate with the difference of sample means. And so in these two cases, if we want to do anything more If we want anything more than, um, than a point estimate, which is you know the number you would get, then we need to know about the sampling distribution. of the estimators. So, um, so I'll write them down of P1 hat minus P2 hat 
or um, x1 bar minus x2 bar. So the, the content of, of chapter 20 is more or less the same as the content of the previous few chapters. The sort of inference we'll do, the sort of estimates we come up with, they, they're, you know, the sampling distribution of the estimator winds up being important. Um, and again, we're very lucky. Um, these are exactly situations in which the sampling distribution winds up being normal or reasonably close to normal in the case of the difference of means. Um, so the typical approach is maybe to discuss this one first. So we'll talk a little about that today, um, but I'd like to maybe take a break um, from me talking and then maybe go and have people look at a couple of examples. Um, so this particular document is under Blackboard now, under classroom handouts for this week. It will reappear next week. Um, I'd like to break people into groups um, and I'd like the groups to consider this problem right here. So it's, it's a problem involving some proportions. Um, so you can read a little about problem one. Um, I'd like the groups to consider A. Um, I'll worry, we'll worry, don't worry about B. We'll, we'll think about that in, in groups. So think maybe first about A. Come up, try to come up with a statistical hypothesis and not explaining exactly how to do that. But what I would say is that the hypotheses here that you're considering Think about them in context of what we talked about so far, remembering that statistical hypotheses are related to parameters. Um, so I don't, we don't necessarily need to conduct, need to conduct the test. Um, so I'd like to start and just have the groups read the problem. Think about A, don't do D yet. Um, so this document you can find under classroom handouts. Um, so I'll stop sharing right now, but just do A, take a few minutes to do it. Um, think about what might make sense, maybe maybe more than one thing makes sense, um, and then we'll think a little bit about the conditions that we need to check. So we'll probably only need about six groups, not 16 groups, a um, handful of participants, so I'll create the groups now. Right now it's about 147. Um, I'd like the groups to discuss maybe the first the first problem, read it, think about what the hypothesis, think, think about what statistical hypothesis that you'd like to formulate. Um, and then we'll see if we can actually conduct the test. So I'll open the rooms. Um, you should be invited to a room now. It's about 147. Like to meet again um, at about 153 or so. So welcome back. Um, so I'd like to talk a little about the problem. Think about, think about the statistical tests that we might use. There's not a lot of detail yet about how to conduct the test, and that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll work with the details in just a moment. Um, but you know, when we're thinking about the test, how should it look, how should the test be conducted? Um, you know, we also can go back and think a little bit about proportions like in chapter 16, we can wonder how we want to construct a confidence interval. Um, so I'd like to prop, I'd like to kind of, um, I'd like to try to, I'd, I'd like to try to build both of those um, in the course of doing this problem. Um, maybe think about how to, do, how to do both of those things at the same time even. So in this particular question, you know, you have, um, you have this problem. Um, researchers at the National Cancer Institute conducted a study. Uh, it investigated the effect of weed killing herbicides on house pets. So they take a random sample, I guess, of 827 dogs from homes where herbicide is used on a regular basis. And then it looks at 130 dogs where no herbicides are used. Um, and it looks at how many people, how many dogs have lymphoma from both categories. Um, we can check the conditions, but again, a couple of things to point out. It looks like homes which use herbicides and homes which don't use herbicides. You're dealing with independent samples. Um, it's reasonable to think that the populations are independent, but you know, maybe, maybe you might have some object objection to that. Um, internally, it seems like the groups, like knowing something about one dog wouldn't tell you very much about other dogs. Um, you know, it seems like um, the samples are relatively small. So, you know, the sorts of conditions that, that you might, um, might want to think about from some previous chapter, they seem to apply, but, you know, we'll probably need to write those down at some point. Um, I'd like to concentrate a little on A. So um, the problem itself suggests notation that you use. Um, P sub H represents the proportion of dogs from homes in, in the population um, that, that get lymphoma from homes that use herbicide on a regular basis. And P sub NH represents the proportion of dogs with lymphoma from homes that do not use herbicide on a regular basis. Um, so that's uh, probably not worry about that, but it's P that's, that's, that's probably the, the concern. So proportion, right? 
Um, so the null hypothesis in this type of experiment is that there is no difference, and that's not atypical. So there, there are a couple of ways to formulate that null hypothesis, which are more or less equivalent. One of those ways is to, is to just, just to, to, to do what, to do the most obvious thing where we, we sort of assert that the, the population proportions are equal. So that's sort of the, the, the nothing is interesting hypothesis. Um, now the alternative can be formulated in more than one way, but the way this particular question is, is, is asked, I think that there's a certain formulation which might make more sense than the other. And it's that the population of dogs, when you're dealing with dogs that live in homes where herbicide is used, that the proportion they get lymphoma is greater than the proportion um, of, of dogs with, that, 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 that get lymphoma from homes that do not use herbicides. So this is probably how I would, I would formulate the problem. Um, another equivalent formulation, and sometimes you see this, is that the difference in proportions is zero. <laughs> um, or that, you know, if you regard this, this inequality, you know, an equivalent formulation of that inequality looks something like this. It's greater than zero. So you can sort of set, you can sort of see that this relationship holds exactly what this holds. So um, I'll leave it to you to figure out like which particular formulation you want. I kind of prefer this one because we're talking about the difference of proportions. Um, occasionally I might, I might write that down, but often I'll write that down. So before I move on, um, are people basically okay with what we're doing? We at least can formulate the, the hypothesis. If nothing else, we can, we can at least look into what we should investigate. Um, when we're trying to figure out whether or not um, there's statistically significant evidence against the null hypothesis, therefore in favor of the alternative hypothesis, I guess. There are usually some conditions that have to be satisfied. Um, I'll write down briefly, and, and we'll concentrate, I think, more about this, on, more on this next week, um, what we would need to actually look at. So on part B, we usually have to check, you know, some independence and randomization condition within groups. Now, what I'd like to say about that briefly is that independence within groups and randomization in groups is often a feature of who the experimenters are. Um, if you know that a particular study is done by a group which is somewhat reputable, even if you have not read it, like say the National Cancer Institute, it's not unreasonable to think that they've done their job in such a way so that they've randomly, um, they've randomly come up with the samples and that there's no particular relationship in sample. From, from dog to dog. 10% um, condition you're usually having to check as well. Um, certainly reasonable to think this is satisfied because when you look at the sample sizes, they're relatively small. So in this particular problem, um, the size of the sample of dogs from a house which from house from the collection of houses which use herbicide on a regular basis it's only 827 dogs from from houses which do not use herbicide it's only 130 you know in each group you're you're thinking that 827 is far far less than 10 percent of dogs from homes where herbicide is used regularly so you think the population of dogs from such homes is far larger and the same is true for the other sample as well so that's plausible um, you know, and just like before, there's usually some kind of success failure condition. Failure. Um, so I won't do the calculation here, but it's it's the calculation that you would you would sort of expect to check, but you have to check it for both groups. So um, check this. So I won't do it right now, but for the H group and the NH group, herbicide and no herbicide. So you check these independently. Um, because you're dealing with two populations, there's an additional condition to worry about. And that condition is, are the populations themselves independent? Um, I would say yes, um, mainly because you're choosing dogs from one population and knowing something about that population won't necessarily tell you about the other population. That's kind of what you're looking for. So 
with these conditions, um, you know, without knowing the actual, without reading the actual study, it's hard to say very much more than that. Um, but when you find yourself in a position of reading a paper, you know, these types of things should be going on in the back of your mind. Um, and the reason is that, you know, if, so, if, if you have, if you have violations of one or more of these conditions that represents kind of a point of departure, it becomes difficult to, to sort of take seriously the results. Um, if you feel like, if you feel like there's a problem. Um, now, I won't say too much about, you know, C because when a question like C is, is asked, you're, you're using StatCrunch to, to sort of perform the test. Um, I'd like to draw your attention. I mean, we can do that, I think, probably easily next week or even now. But when you're talking about using StatCrunch to perform the test, um, let, me, let me share the screen. Um, how would how would you perform a statistical test using StatCrunch with no formulas whatsoever? Um, you you might already be experienced with running such tests. I do want to talk about the formulas for a bit, but maybe that's not so important right now. Um, if you want to perform the statistical test, go to Stat, Proportion Stats, to Sample, with Summary. And so um, you have Sample One and Sample Two. Um, you generally have to decide something about the alternative hypothesis that you want to test. Notice the formulation of, of, of the test is the second formulation I wrote down. Basically, it's looking at the difference. Um, difference greater than zero is what we want right here. Um, you would have to enter the information, the number of successes, the number of observations, and so forth. Um, and you, you don't even need to input the significance level. You can sort of just see what the p-value is and interpret the result. Um, so. That's one way of doing it. If you want to come up with a confidence interval for the difference, it will even do that as well. So, I mean, I won't do that right here. That's easy enough to do. So um, you can actually get StatCrunch to carry out the calculation associated with this problem. Um, you, know, you can take a minute or two to do that, but maybe, maybe we'll wait till next week or maybe you can do it over the weekend and see what you get. Um, and we'll do that first thing on Monday. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, I guess on, you know, for some of the subsequent questions, Let's see. Ah, so someone did ask, is the success failure still supposed to be greater than 10 for both populations? The answer to that question is yes. And so you do have to check these, you do have to check these for both populations. They both should be greater than 10. In the context of, in the context of this question, you look at the sample proportion and its relationship to N. So um, whatever proportion you get, um, you look at P hat times N, you look at one minus P hat times N, but you do so for both. Um, and so you are checking these things to make sure that you have enough. And again, these are safeguards against the sampling distribution of one or more of the variables in question being too weird. Um, the principle that gets used for this type of inference is that very roughly, see, very roughly speaking, if you, if you happen to know that both P1 hat, or I guess in this example, PH hat and PNH hat, if you happen to know that both of those guys are normally distributed, it shows their difference. Um, it turns out that the sampling distribution of the difference of proportions that we're discussing in these, in these mod, with these conditions satisfied is itself a normal distribution. And so that's kind of what, um, you know, that's kind of what underlies the analysis. Um, that's not really revealed in StatCrunch and it's sort of this mathematical fact that you have to convince yourself of um, by, by playing around with, I guess, some symbols long enough to, to make it reasonable. Um, I don't really want to go into that. I think the author spends a little time, it's, it's related to these questions about how expected value and variance work, but it's been so long since we've talked about that, I don't, I mean, I don't want to write anything more down about it than that. But those conditions that you're, that you're asking about, the, the success failure conditions and some of the others, those are conditions which are basically checking to see that the individual distributions are normal. And if you know that, if you, if you feel that that's right, then it will turn out that the difference of p hats is also normally distributed. And then we can do inference if we know that. And, um, and so it's worthwhile to check that just to make sure. Um, so I think it's 205, but I robbed you of about five, five, 10 minutes last, last yesterday. So I feel like I should pay it back. Um, I'll end right now um, with about five minutes to go. So I'll stay around for another five, four or five minutes if people want to ask questions. But we're going to begin exactly here on Monday talking about chapter 20. I'd like people to read a little bit about chapter 19 over the weekend, if you have time. 
um, those two chapters are the content of next week. So I think enough for today. Thank you. Thank you.